until about 1897 um, uh, that electrons uh, were discovered. Um, you see, J.J. Uh, Thompson had been experimenting with the cathode ray tube. Uh, this is a tube in which uh, there was a cathode and also an anode. Now, uh, the cathode was negatively charged and would expel uh, uh, cathode rays, these uh, green particles here, uh, towards the positively charged anode. Um, one could surmise uh, that these cathode rays might be uh, uh, negatively charged because they're expelled from this negatively charged electrode and they're attracted to uh, the positively charged anode. Um, but uh, it can also be uh, figured, and J.J. Thompson did figure, uh, that they are negatively charged uh, by the fact that um, not only are they going towards that positive anode and then, uh, in this case, uh, going through a tiny slit and hitting a fluorescent screen where uh, light can be seen when they hit. Whereas they normally might hit uh, going straight through, uh, they can be influenced by uh, other uh, electrodes. For example, having another negatively charged electrode up top uh, and then a positively charged electrode at the bottom, uh, these cathode rays, they were repelled from the negatively charged electrode and attracted to that positively charged electrode veering downwards here. Uh, you can see that with the electrode, uh, they veer downwards. But um, having magnets, uh, a, a south uh, end of a magnet on, on one end and a north end of the magnet on the back end, uh, those cathode rays uh, were veered upwards, um, which uh, would be in agreement with the, the knowledge of the time of how negatively charged uh, particles are influenced by magnets. And so, uh, it was realized that these cathode rays are negatively charged. And also that these cathode rays, no matter what the originating, excuse me, uh, no matter what uh, the originating cathode is, uh, whatever element it is, or uh, regardless of what gases are present in this tube, um, these cathode rays always have the same properties. Um, they're emitted from uh, atoms within the uh, cathode or from within the gas, and they are always the same. Um, they always have um, they always have uh, the same um, mass to charge ratio. Uh, yes, uh, these mass these cathode rays are always have the mass same mass to charge ratio, which was determined by uh, kind of influencing uh, the strength of the electrode versus the strength of the magnets and, uh, and, and some math uh, that was done later on. Um, and so uh, these cathode rays, they're the same coming from all elements. Uh, they must be in all elements. Um, later, it was said that these cathode rays, they could just be called electrons. They're negatively charged electrons. So uh, this was the discovery of these electrons, yet all it provided was that they were negatively charged, they're in all elements, and uh, they have the same mass to charge ratio. But uh, later, Millikan uh, tested um, these electrons. Uh, he would take his small oil droplets and uh, they would fall, um, but uh, he would make them charged by uh, uh, x-rays. Um, making them charged, these small oil droplets would get negative charge on them, uh, static electricity. Uh, and uh, then, whereas gravity would pull them downwards, uh, having a negatively charged electrode at bottom and positively charged electrode at top, uh, they would be uh, pushed upwards by the repulsive forces from the negative charge or the attraction to the positive charge. So uh, these uh, oil droplets were able to be suspended, being that this, the force going down from gravity was the same as the force going up uh, from the electrodes. And so um, by manipulating um, the strength of those electrodes, uh, Millikan was able to calculate for the charge uh, of the electrons on those oil droplets. And therefore, knowing the charge of the oil, uh, of the electrons on the oil droplets, um, and knowing the mass to charge ratio, uh, Millikan was able to calculate for the mass of electrons. So that um, plenty of information was provided on the electrons. And now, 
knowing uh, that there were electrons in uh, atoms, uh, which had been uh, postulated by Dalton, uh, Thompson's model of the atom uh, had that these negatively charged electrons were distributed throughout the atom. But being that there was negative charge there, there must also have been positive charge. Uh, yet, uh, not knowing much about the positive charge, it was hypothesized that it was distributed equally throughout uh, the atom. It, um, it was spread out very much um, so that uh, the positive and the negative charges could stabilize each other. Um, now, uh, it was said that these negative charges, they were spread out like plums in a pudding. Uh, or uh, in modern day parlance, you might say, like chocolate chips in a chocolate chip cookie. Now, um, this theory, though, was uh, amended after Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Uh, he had been uh, playing with alpha particles. These are um, particles emitted uh, radioactively. They're, um, I guess, uh, helium ion. Um, they're positively charged. And these positively charged particles, uh, he was shooting them through gold foil. Uh, and he expected that going through gold foil and, uh, according to Thompson's uh, plum pudding model, having that positive charge in those gold atoms being uh, widely distributed, there would be only um, a very uh, kind of uh, gentle deflection of these positively charged particles as they traveled through the gold. Um, I guess uh, the low density of the positive charge in these gold atoms should only gently deflect uh, these positively charged alpha particles. Yet, uh, this uh, gentle deflection and traveling straight through uh, the gold uh, foil was not actually what happened. Uh, no, instead, though almost all uh, alpha particles traveled through the gold foil uh, and were then seen uh, at the detecting screen, uh, occasionally there would be a moderate deflection or even sometimes a very extreme deflection of this alpha particle. Uh, they would be dramatically bounced back, which was very surprising to Rutherford. Uh, he said that it was like shooting a cannonball at tissue paper and, uh, it, uh, and the cannonball bouncing back at you. Uh, this is how shocking uh, this result was. How is it that uh, this dramatic reflection, or actually deflection, of these alpha particles can occur? Yes, most particles make it through uh, the atoms, but occasionally they would bounce dramatically back. Uh, yes, very occasionally um, there would be uh, that very dramatic deflection. Uh, the occasionality of that implied that uh, that positive charge uh, must be in a very small space. You see, if the positive charge is in a very small space, most particles should be able just to flow by, whereas uh, being that they will occasionally be dramatically deflected, um, they must uh, be in a very high density. So uh, this uh, area where uh, this small volume where all of the positive charge exists, this very high density positive charge, this could explain this dramatic deflection of, uh, of the electrodes. Uh, yes, so again, um, the occasionality meant that uh, that positive charge must not come into contact with the alpha particles often. Um, uh, it, it must be in a very small volume. And the dramatic deflection means that uh, those occasional uh, deflections um, uh, must be occurring by very uh, extreme repulsion, which can only occur because that positively charged alpha, alpha particle is hitting something very, very, very positively charged. And so therefore knowing uh, that this positive charge was in a small volume and very dense, it was realized that all of the positive charge, all of the protons uh, within the nucleus, uh, within the atom exist in the nucleus. We can see a depiction of this here. Here's an entire atom. The electrons are on the outside, more or less. And the nucleus is in the very center. Uh, this is very, very, very small. We can see a zoomed-in picture where we have the protons and the neutrons. Yes, the nucleus is extremely small in volume. It's like uh, a marble uh, uh, within uh, a, a football stadium. 
uh, that is kind of the same, uh, I guess, uh, order of magnitude of uh, the nucleus versus the entire atom. Uh, an atom, by the way, is 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers. No, um, it was later discovered uh, uh, the charge and mass of protons and neutrons as well. Um, it was realized that protons have a positive one charge, electrons have a negative one charge, and neutrons have no charge. And uh, that the proton and the neutron have about the same mass, about one atomic mass unit, and the electron is much smaller, about one uh, 1840th of the mass of a proton or neutron. Um, this AMU, atomic mass unit, uh, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 AMUs in one gram. All right, thanks for watching, guys.